Thanks to CuriosityStream for supporting PBS Digital Studios. Hey there, I'm Mike Rugnetta. This is Crash Course Theater, and believe it or not, theater in England doesn't end with Shakespeare. Nope, it's gonna take some buzzkill Protestants to shut down that iamic pentama party, but we're gonna meet them next time. Today we're gonna look at English drama after Shakespeare, explore the work of Shakespeare's contemporary Ben Jonson, and check out some disturbingly violent Jacobean and Caroline revenge tragedies. We'll end with a visit to the Caroline court masks, which were created because nobles were like, theater is amazing, we wanna act too. Ugh, amateurs, right? You're, ugh. You're making me look bad. We ended our last episode with Ben Jonson's tribute to his old pal Shakespeare. Jonson belongs with Shakespeare and Christopher Marlowe as one of the big deal playwrights of the English Renaissance. But his plays are harder to love. They're very witty, but also very wordy. Which is funny because that's pretty much what he said about Will. His wit was in his own power. Would the rule of it had been so too, Elizabethan Byrne. Johnson was born in 1572. His father died before his birth and his mother married a bricklayer. So when it came time to go to university, Johnson had to become an apprentice bricklayer instead. He was not psyched. Eventually, he went off to the Netherlands to become a soldier, but then got tired of windmills and killing people, so he came back to London to work as an actor and a playwright, though apparently he wasn't much of an actor. He wrote some tragedies, then some comedies, and his plays got him into trouble a lot, as he tended to fill them with racy political passages and personal attacks. Unlike Shakespeare, Johnson specialized in city comedies with plenty of contemporary references. Like Shakespeare and, um, Everyone, it seems, his work is deeply indebted to Plautus and Terence. Johnson is best known for his comedies of the humors. The theory of the four humors said that bodies were composed of black bile, yellow bile, blood, and phlegm, and that illness resulted when the humors were out of balance. Bring on the leeches and the purgatives. But even in a healthy body, it was thought one or two humors predominated, and these determined someone's personality, which could be bilious, choleric, sanguine, or phlegmatic. Yorick is a phlegmat through and through. Well, except for the parts of him that are hollow. Anyway, if you read Johnson, you'll find that his vision of humanity is a lot less expansive than Shakespeare's, but he's still a lot of fun. Let's look at one of Johnson's greatest plays, Volpone, first performed at the Globe by Shakespeare's company, The King's Men. It's a comedy that takes an intensely skeptical view of human nature. Volpone is about humans behaving like animals, if animals behaved really poorly, and then lawyered up. You can think of it as the crass menagerie. Help us out with that bubble. Volpone, whose name means fox, comes up with a hilarious prank. He's gonna fool a bunch of his friends into thinking he's on his deathbed. Lol. So, with the help of his servant Mosca, which means fly, he pretends to be violently ill. Voltore, Vulture, Corbaccio, Raven, and Corvino, Crow, all come to his house in Venice, bringing lavish gifts because they're hoping Volpone will bequeath them all his stuff. Corbaccio disinherits his son just to impress Volpone. Corvino agrees to let Volpone sleep with his young, beautiful wife. The beautiful wife resists, and Corbaccio's disinherited son rescues her. They accuse Volpone of attempted rape, but Voltore, a lawyer, has the wife and the son imprisoned instead. What a foul move. Thinking like a fox, Volpone then decides it will be even more hilarious if he pretends to be dead and makes everyone believe he's left his fortune to Mosca. The bird dudes go to court to contest Volpone's will. Mosca tries to keep Volpone's money. Volpone shows up in court and tells everyone what jerks the bird guys are. And I mean, He's not wrong. The judge punishes them, but because it's finally time for a little moral authority, he also punishes Volpone and Mosca, and I mean, he's not wrong either. By the end, Volpone has lost his money and his health, and he's going to prison, maybe forever. I'm never gonna look at a fox the same way again. Thank you, Thought Bubble. I guess that was funny. As you can see, this is a comedy that feels very different from the comedies of Shakespeare. It's compact and elegantly plotted, but the psychology is a lot less nuanced, the morality is a lot less ambiguous, and characters are more stereotypical and thin stand-ins for animals. We laugh with Shakespeare's characters, but we laugh at Johnson's characters, as they basically try to out 
terrible one another. And whereas women are the center of Shakespeare's comedies, in Johnson's comedies they hardly matter at all. In Volpone, Corvino's wife Celia is only present as a potential rape victim. Her own thoughts and desires don't matter, which is ugly. And where Shakespeare's tone is fairly hopeful in the comedies, Johnson's is not. Does Johnson seem dark? Well, theater is actually about to get a lot darker, with incest, werewolves, poisoned incense, poisoned pictures, poisoned swords, poisoned everything, basically, including poisoned skulls. I wonder if there's something Yorick is keeping from me. Anyways, yes, it's revenge tragedy, one of the most decadent forms of English Renaissance drama. Revenge tragedy, or as it's sometimes awesomely called, the tragedy of blood, or the sex tragedy, is a genre that gets going pre-Shakespeare. When our boy Ben Jonson was just back from the Netherlands, he played the lead role in one of the first examples, Thomas Kidd's The Spanish Tragedy from 1587. Revenge tragedy borrows its form from Seneca, but where Seneca is extremely interested in moral choice, these plays are much more interested in lurid forms of murder. Though, to be honest, Seneca was interested in that too. As Vindice says in the 1606 play The Revenger's Tragedy, which was probably written by Thomas Middleton, when the bad bleed, then is the tragedy good. So yeah, there's a lot of blood. Many tragedies also have meta-theatrical elements, like plays inside plays, or scenes of intentional disguise, or characters performing madness. Shakespeare writes an on-the-nose revenge tragedy in Titus Andronicus, which owes a huge debt to Seneca, then elevates the genre with Hamlet by making us feel very deeply for the revenger and having Hamlet constantly question the morality of his actions. Until the play's final scenes, he's still debating the righteousness of revenge, and wondering if there's a way to escape the tragic cycle. He kills a lot of people, but he never becomes a complete villain, and even in the end, we still side with him. Most playwrights weren't that high-minded. John Ford's Tis Pity She's a Whore is a Romeo and Juliet story, except Romeo and Juliet are brother and sister. There's a lot of random murder and lewd dancing, and in the climactic scene, the brother kills his pregnant sister and comes back into the banquet hall with her heart on the end of his sword. Remember when you thought Cymbeline was intense? Seems a little quaint now, don't it? There's also The Duchess of Malfi, in which a woman's brothers drive her mad by making wax statues of her dead children because she marries below her station. And The Revenger's Tragedy, in which a duke makes out with a poisoned skull and then gets stabbed while he watches his wife betray him with another man. But here's a surprise. The Revenge Tragedy is still considered a moral genre sometimes, because of all the gore. Some critics argue that the plays emphasize the destructiveness of revenge and warn about the consequences when men take on the kind of retributive justice that should be left to God, though God doesn't tend to go for anything as fancy as lunatics performing dance numbers. Other critics, though, insist that Jacobean tragedies are so extreme because they are a radical form that is deliberately flouting restrictive social codes and accepted norms of behavior. They show the stark problems of sex and class underlying Jacobean complacency. Still others think they're mostly interested in acting out sadistic fantasies and delivering just shocks and thrills. The last genre we'll discuss today is the court mask, a very fancy kind of theater that was performed by and for nobles with professional actors taking on the comic roles, because as everyone knows, nobles are not funny. Why were the court masks so popular? Well, they affirmed existing power structures. And they put the royals in some really mind-blowing doublets. Work it, nobles. Masks have their roots in the Middle Ages and derive from the pageants, processionals, and tableau vivants that were created to celebrate royal occasions like births and marriages. In court masks, a mix of professional performers and nobles, or if you were unlucky, just nobles, would act out some allegorical scene backed by sumptuous scenery and attired in knockout garb. Most of the action was set to music. Masks were about themes like love and beauty and virtue, and acted out with fairy tale stories of nymphs and gods and cupids. They had a little poetry and a little plot and a lot of music and dancing. They provided spectacular visuals that emphasized the elegance of the court and the magnificence of the ruler, reasserting that kings and queens ruled because that's 
how God wants it. Often, the men of the court would present a mask, and then the women of the court would answer it with another. The masks themselves were often preceded by comic or grotesque anti-masks, showing a disruption of the social order, like, say, a couple of rogue satyrs up to no good, maybe making trouble in the neighborhood which would be magically fixed by the arrival of the king's representatives on stage. Most Jacobean and Caroline playwrights wrote a mask or two, but the foremost mask maker was Fanfare Please, Mr. Ben Johnson, who managed to put those badly behaved animals aside long enough to dream up confections about nymphs and goddesses and constellations. What a job. Johnson's partner was Inigo Jones, the absolute genius of Renaissance set design, and one of the crucial figures in the transition of theater construction towards the proscenium arch that we know and sometimes love today. Jones had spent some time in Italy and absorbed the innovations in Italian stagecraft. He introduced perspectival staging to England and invented all sorts of awesome stage machinery, like clouds that would carry nobles to the stage floor. The court mask bromance of Johnson and Jones eventually broke up, though, because Johnson thought the words were more important, and Jones thought the pictures were more important. And well, I suppose the tragedy is that they were both right and wrong. Maybe they'd exhausted the nymph genre anyway. So, do all of these revenge tragedies seem excessive? They are. Do all of these court masks sound really expensive? They were. And that's gonna make some Puritans very unhappy. So enjoy your poisoned incense and majestic scenery while you can, because pretty soon the Puritans are gonna make like those Goths and Visigoths and tank theater for a while. We've seen this cycle before in Western theater, from simplicity to virtuosity to decadence to bye-bye theater. Maybe we'll see it again. It's almost like history does this thing where it repeats itself. Anyway, thanks for watching. It's been Sanguine. Curtain. Thank you to Curiosity Stream for supporting PBS Digital Studios. Curiosity Stream is a subscription streaming service that offers documentaries and nonfiction titles from a variety of filmmakers, including Curiosity Stream Originals. For instance, Curiosity Stream has Ancient Earth, a three part series chronicling the extraordinary life forms that evolved during three of Earth's most significant geologic periods. You can learn more at curiositystream.com slash crash course and use the code crash course during the sign up process. Crash Course Theater is produced in association with PBS Digital Studios. Head over to their channel to check out some of their shows like The Art Assignment and Eons and It's Okay to Be Smart. Crash Course Theater is filmed in the Chad and Stacey Emigold's studio in Indianapolis, Indiana, and is produced with the help of all of these very nice people. Our animation team is Thought Cafe. Crash Course exists thanks to the generous support of our patrons at Patreon. Patreon is a voluntary subscription service where you can support the content you love through a monthly donation and help keep Crash Course free for everyone forever. Thanks for watching.